Uh, dear professors, dear audience, thank you for having me again. Day two is as good or even better than day one. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, in 1996, uh, Dr. Souza from Brazil changed the world that we know by proving that you can enter into the pericardial space without there being fluid around the heart. You can enter this potential space. This is an example, I apologize, the uh, uh, transmission is not perfect. I tried to do this late last night and it didn't quite work. But anyway, what you're seeing here is dye uh, staining the tissue as you're entering uh, right under the um, <coughs> xiphoid process. Let me find a point you see that. So this is the xiphoid bone. And, here, uh, and then the needle is coming right through underneath. Staining the tissue, stains the pericardium, and then very faintly you're seeing a layer of dye uh, um, around the silhouette of the heart when there is no diffusion. This was done for the purpose of a lariat um, occlusion, and we used a 90 degrees lateral projection um, for entry. Our objective is anti access to the anterior surface of the heart. Um, when Sosa uh, first described his cases, he was dealing with Ch uh, Chagas disease. And they end up with a lot of scar on the inferior wall. And so you'll see his trajectory is um, more uh, perpendicular to the heart, and then he enters a little bit. So, so the point is that uh, 20 years later, we know we can enter to the front of the heart, to the back of the heart. He opened a new world for us by proving that the epicardium is at the Why do we even need to go there? The idea is that this is the thickness of the ventricular muscle. If you're limiting yourself to the endocardium, as we have been for the longest time, the ablation lesion will only have um, a maximum depth of about 10 millimeters. What if your scar is here, in the mid myocardium? What if it is here, closer to the uh, epicardial surface? And that's the kind of scar that is creating the ventricular tachycardia. You may be able to access this maybe from the endocardium. You clearly will not be able to um, affect this. To a large degree. This is an example from dilated cardiomyopathy. And what you're looking at is late gadolinium and Hansen. In this case, this is deep in the septum. You see this bright area. In uh, another case, it's uh, spanning the whole thickness of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And uh, in these two cases, in C, there's patchy fibrosis and different. There's this one right here, and this one. The point is, in a dilated cardiomyopathy, you can have uh, fibrosis that um, is in different areas of the heart, not necessarily following the coronary distribution, and secondly, in different locations within the thickness of the myocardium. So, what are the substrates where you necessarily, or you should be thinking about, uh, need for epicardial, uh, epicardial access? Clearly, let's get this out of the way. Idiopathic VT, where there is no underlying structural heart disease, is very unlikely that you will need to go through. The highest on the list is ARVC. We saw a fantastic case yesterday that was presented by our colleagues from uh, Saudi, and, um, and that's pretty much what we're looking for. Right after that, it's true, out of the dilated cardiomyopathies, there will be some that will need that. But I have to admit to you that as a general, DP person who's not in a referral center for VTs alone. I have not needed to do a lot of um, epicardial access. In fact, when I think back, I think we were doing it more uh, 10 years ago, and we're doing less, and I think it has to do with the efficacy of the uh, ablation catheters that we have now with, uh, with the irrigation and so on. So, and better, uh, better strategies also for ablation. Uh, you heard very elegantly from Stefano how he goes about the scar and reducing channels and so on. Um, this kind of aggressive approach from endocardial ablation has really limited the need for going to the epicardial 
uh, aspect, particularly in ischemic cardiomyopathy. But it's true that ischemic cardiomyopathies are on the list. Then you have a, a, a host of other things. Perhaps maybe sarcoidosis is one of the things that you might run into. But I agree with what uh, Stefano also showed, is that the main indication for going epicardial is having failed endocardial. Uh, earlier, in the, in, when we started, we were excited about it. They have endocardial and epicardial. In every case you go, you don't know what you're going to need. That is not the case. You can always bring a patient back. Do endocardial, finish what you need to do. You got a good result, be thankful. You didn't bring him back this time, say, maybe there were some things about the VT that could make you think about using the epicardial. So let's go through some of the um, criteria that different uh, groups have uh, proposed. The group in PEN, in particular, have been very active in this. Clearly, QRS duration. OK, let's first think, what are these numbers about? The idea is that if your uh, VT breakout is on the endocardial surface, it will engage the hispertension system somewhere. Anywhere in the hispertension system, it will engage in it. It will activate the rest of the ventricle using the firewire system that is the hispertension. Now, this is located closer to the endocardial surface. The epicardial surface is very remote from that. So now you have muscle-to-muscle -muscle conduction going for a long time before it sees the first opening into the network of the hypertension virus. Once you have that in mind, now the numbers, you can always keep them in your back uh, pocket. But the QRS duration will be longer, right? And though nobody has agreed, it's very hard to, to say that something is epicardial if your uh, QRS duration is 120 or 140 milliseconds. You need to see a delta wave, a pseudo delta wave, very much like an accessory pathway. It's the same idea. You're activating muscle to muscle, right? And then the intrinsic wave deflection time is the time to the peak of your um, R wave. And what is the width of the shortest uh, SRS, and then the other one that you could look at is the maximum deflection index. So all these are duration criteria. Let's take a look at one example that was, um, it's been widely quoted as, a, as an example. It's again from the pen group. So this is a patient whose intrinsic weight deflection time is 112. The QRS duration is greater than 200. He has a prominent pseudo delta wave at 56 to 12, something like 49. And uh, the shortest complex is 157, which is longer than 120. And we can, we can look at the numbers at any place, it doesn't matter. But duration is not enough. You also need to look at morphology. If the activation is coming straight from the epicardium, then in lead one, you would expect to see a QS configuration. Uh, Whereas in inferior leads, you will always have a positive deflection. Contrarily, if you're activating from endocardium, you can expect to have first the wavefront going towards lead one, and so you'd have absence of a Q wave in lead one, and more of um, uh, a Q wave in the inferior leads. Understand, we're talking about dilated cardiomyopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy Scars do tend to gravitate to be around the mitral annulus, all right? And so um, this particularly applies to that. These are some examples showing what we just talked about. These are separate uh, a series of patients. The ones on the left are epicardial. The ones on the right are endocardial. Let me just point out here. When we say epicardial VT, we mean they ablated it on the epicardial. When we say endocardial, means it means ablated on the endocardial doesn't mean that it's just where the scar, where you are able to get it. So clearly in all of these, there is um, uh, a positive, uh, there is no positive deflection. There's always a Q uh, in the lead one, whereas in the um, inferior leads, there is a Q in the endocardial. So that's one example to keep in mind. This is a very tricky area. This is called the left ventricular summit. It is close to the base of the heart. It is bounded by the circumflex, the LAD, and the coronary vein. Not only is it difficult because the coronary <coughs> arteries are very close to you, but usually there is a thick layer of fat 
your ablation will be very ineffective. Um, this is the experience from 23 patients that were mapped to the left ventricular summit. The uh, uh, epicardial access was a pain, and uh, they did not attempt ablation in nine of these patients. They did attempt in 14, and they had acute failure in nine and acute success in five. Out of those, one uh, did not succeed later on. What are we saying? This is from Penn, again, uh, a place that wakes up and goes to sleep doing VT, and still, from the left ventricular summit, they had a very poor success rate. One example is here. Uh, this is from a different group. They did, uh, this patient shows up, and does he meet criteria? Yes, he does. Right lead one is a QS, and the inferior leads are positive. And then, uh, sure enough, it maps to, uh, this is endocardial and epicardial. Max, <coughs> pay attention to these electrograms. This is activation map. Yesterday you heard how activation map is very helpful. Um, and the RVOT is even with the QRS, it doesn't beat it. The same as with the LVOT from endocardium. But when you go to the uh, epicardium on the uh, L uh, <coughs> now you're beating the QRS by something like 20 milliseconds. You're early. The unipolar is negative. And the, uh, there's all this late fractionation that this uh, fractionated electrogram, which is also seen even in design. This is the pace map, and it's a 12 out of 12 match. But it's in a tough area in the summer. They were not able to late. They sent him to surgery. And that particular case, they were able to do with alcohol ablation. OK. Uh, I can finish in uh, one minute, sir. I think it's important that we talk about complications because we sometimes get excited about technique and we need to know what we're getting into. Obviously, you're right uh, in front of the right ventricle. The problem is not puncturing the right ventricle once. You can get away with it. And then you do it twice, and then you do it three times. Now, you better watch out, all right? Worst of all is when you puncture the RV and you don't know it. You go one way, you come out the other, and you think you're in the pericardium because the dye is layering. You put your sheet, and when does the disaster happen? When you're finished. And now where did this come from? This is a Cleveland clinic telling us that this is happening. So now we know that these things are going to happen. Hemopericardium may be from puncture of a vessel or uh, puncture of the RV, but also just some patients just are more friable and delicate. Anytime you're manipulating the catheter going back and forth, they start bleeding. Air in itself is not necessarily a problem with oversolve. And then almost everybody that you violate the pericardium in will have pericarditis. You need to treat them with colchicine or non-steroidal just for a few days. Um, this is uh, an example just to kind of illustrate for you how the access is obtained. Uh, you can see the sheath there as it enters. But your relationship to the diaphragm is very clear. This can be a problem. If you puncture below the diaphragm, Mm -hmm. Now you may uh, violate the liver and cause a hematoma in the liver, and, and this can, or you could uh, violate one of the epigastrial blood vessels, and you can have a retroperitoneal hematoma, which could be horrible, or as in this case, this patient had a large liver hematoma. So these are things to keep in mind if you entertain this procedure. I thank you for your patience. And